Good afternoon, everyone. I really want to thank everybody first for, for making time to be a part of this important webinar. Uh, I happen to be out in Richmond, so I need to acknowledge them in the traditional territories of the Musqueam peoples, uh, unceded territory. And uh, I'm really grateful that we're able to gather as many concerned citizens of the like mind to uh, make a stand, uh, to stand up and demand that the environment be respected in its fullest context and to not be distracted by the modern day beads and trinkets that the federal government wants to bring out to First Nations people. And I think that what they're doing is they're capitalizing on poverty and exploiting a situation that they themselves have created. And it is going to take a strong measure of reconciliation amongst First Nations and Canadians to stand united and to continue on with the struggle that we have to uh, put a stop to this, this madness, this, uh, this Kinder Morgan twinning and the fact that it is just simply unwelcome in far too many places. But uh, I'll keep my comments brief. I want to introduce uh, Mr. Josh Patterson from the BC Civil Liberties Union, and he's going to provide us with the legal update. Gail Kessler. Thanks very much, uh, Chief Chamberlain. I'm, uh, I just want to make sure my slides are coming up there. I'll just start in while I yeah, Go ahead, Josh, and I'll okay. come on. So I'm really happy to speak to all of you here online from Vancouver and unceded Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam. Uh, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, Heichka, thank you for the introduction, for the welcome. I want to thank uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and STAND and acknowledge uh, Chief Bob Chamberlain for the extraordinary leadership uh, that he provides not only to his nation and to Indigenous nations throughout uh, the lands known as BC and Canada through the Union, but also to settlers. Uh, the Union and uh, Chief Chamberlain are always there speaking, educating, uh, holding out a hand to others even as they put their feet down uh, to protect people's rights. Um, and I really want to thank um, Chief Chamberlain um, for having us here today to speak. I'm going to have to go pretty quickly after the Q&A is done uh, for childcare reasons. Um, so please don't uh, take offense uh, if I'm moving rather quickly. Um, what slide have we got up there? I can't actually see. Oh, we can move to my next slide. Thanks. I guess I have to say that. Um, uh, the information that we're going to be providing today is uh, in uh, general in nature. Uh, it's not going to answer all your questions. It's not going to apply to every case. And it's also not legal advice and shouldn't be relied on in any legal uh, proceeding. Um, I want people to be aware uh, that there may be um, police um, who are who are monitoring um, the conversations here today? Um, we know um, for a fact that police have uh, have undertaken monitoring and surveillance of these very kinds of conversations before, and so anyone who's speaking today should expect that that might be true today too. Um, the if we can advance my slide uh, to the next one. Um, so the purpose today is to talk about your rights when you're using your freedom of expression, your freedom of assembly to participate in lawful and democratic protest activity. Um, uh, we want you to know what your rights are so that you can make informed decisions. Um, for the BCCLA today, our purpose is not to promote any particular view, and it's certainly not to promote or encourage any kind of action. Um, no matter what side of an issue you fall on or what actions you take, you have rights. Um, and we're going to talk about what some of those rights are today. Next slide, please. Um, the workshop today is going to deal with the laws of Canada and British Columbia, but I want to acknowledge that Indigenous laws continue to operate uh, on the land. And just because I'm focusing on, um, on the laws of Canada here, it uh, doesn't mean that there other, aren't other laws uh, uh, that are operating and that need to be paid attention to. So, uh, the law of protest in BC. I'm briefly going to cover a few topics today. Um, the first is injunctions and injunction zones. Um, the second is what are your rights upon arrest? Um, uh, the third is what kinds of charges uh, might be related to protests and demonstrations? And the fourth is uh, civil lawsuits against demonstrators. I have a longer version of this presentation that talks about a lot more things to do with your rights when you're dealing with police, whether you have to talk to them, what you have to do if you're being searched, 
all kinds of different things. I can't cover that all today. There are some other resources on the next slide uh, that do talk about those things in detail. One is on the right, the BCCLA's Arrest Handbook, which can be found and downloaded uh, online. It's a few years old, but basically is, uh, is still accurate. And then if you Google for the Guide to the Law of Protests in BC, um, uh, you will find a publication by Leo McGrady, which covers in much more detail everything that I'm going to be talking about today and a whole lot more. So starting straight in on injunctions and injunction zones. Um, an injunction is a court order to stop interference with the legal rights of a person or a company or the government. They're a very powerful tool. And in many ways, they've become the preferred tool for companies and governments to try and put an end to protests, to demonstrations, to occupations, to, um, to tent cities in relation to homelessness, um, and uh, to labor disputes. They aren't given automatically. Um, they can only be given when a company sues someone first. And so if people remember back um, in 2014 when a number of um, activists on Burnaby Mountain were sued, um, there couldn't have been an injunction or an injunction zone unless someone had been sued, unless there was a legal action being taken. So first a company has to sue someone. They have to accuse someone of wronging them in an ongoing way. And then a court has to decide whether to grant an injunction and they hold a hearing for this. When they're holding that hearing, uh, which won't be immediate, sometimes it'll be a week later, it'll depend, um, it'll depend on the availability of parties, uh, it'll depend on the availability of lawyers. But when that hearing comes around, they will assess the merits of a lawsuit. The first thing that they'll consider in deciding whether to grant an injunction is, is there even any merit to this lawsuit to, to begin with? Is there a serious legal matter involved? So there's a hurdle that the person who's suing or the company who's suing has to meet. Um, then they have to figure out whether or not the company would suffer some kind of irreparable harm if the court refused to grant the injunction. And usually the fact that they will be losing some money uh, is enough to show that they will uh, suffer irreparable harm. Um, and usually not a trivial quantity of money, but it's, you know, uh, probably a fairly, um, well, it'll depend, but oftentimes these are fairly decent amounts of money that are alleged to be lost, particularly on larger industrial projects. Uh, then the court has to assess which of the parties, the, either the company or the people, the defendants being sued, would suffer more harm uh, from the injunction being granted or not granted. Um, and if they decide in all the circumstances that it's the company who would suffer more harm, um, then they may grant the injunction in favor of the company. Uh, when a court is making a decision about whether to grant an injunction, they may also be assessing uh, First Nations rights claims that come into play um, uh, around granting the injunction. And there have been some cases uh, recently, or a few years ago, I guess, um, uh, uh, part of the Wet'suwet'en uh, people, um, a clan in the Wet'suwet'en people, actually succeeded in stopping a forestry company from getting an injunction uh, to stop them from taking action on the land uh, because they said that they had uh, um, uh, Aboriginal rights and title in relation to that land and that in fact they would be harmed more if the injunction were granted than the company would have been harmed if the injunction were not granted. Um, an injunction zone, sometimes there will be a zone in an injunction that doesn't just say you can't do a certain thing, but you can't be a certain place. And that's actually what we saw on Burnaby Mountain, for those who remember. Um, there was a zone set up. It was defined by geographic coordinates. Um, and there was a requirement in the court order uh, that that be clearly marked uh, and that everyone be able to know um, what that zone was that you were not allowed to cross. Um, we're gonna come back to the consequences of breaking an injunction in a moment, but um, quickly, are there any questions on an injunction or an injunction zone? Um, or wait a second, hold on, are, to my host, are we actually entertaining questions or not? Are I just steaming through? How's this, how's this gonna work? I think, Josh, that we wanted to hold for, uh, till the end of your okay. presentation okay. for questions. Forgive me, everyone, we'll, we'll, we will hold to the end. 
So I'm going to come back to what happens if injunctions are broken. And I'm going to talk about interactions with police. I'm not going to talk in tons of detail about it because I have a lot more to get to. Um, there are three main reasons that police could ap approach you on, on the street. And this applies in the context of demonstration and actions as well. Um, the first reason is they're just making conversation or they, they need your help with something. Um, the second reason is that they're investigating you and they've decided to detain you in what's called an investigative detention. And the third reason is that they're arresting you. And the rights that you have as a person or as an individual related to the police vary in each of these circumstances. For today's purposes, I'm going to talk about the first reason police are just talking to you very briefly. Um, and then I'm going to skip to the third reason, which is police are arresting you. Um, the investigative detention uh, piece is something I'm going to leave out, but you can find out more about it in um, either of those two guides that I mentioned at the top of the presentation. So generally, if police approach you, do you have to identify yourself? If you're not under arrest, um, you're just walking around, uh, or you're out somewhere, you have to identify yourself. Generally, under the law, the answer is no. You have no legal duty to identify yourself unless the police see you committing a criminal offense. Okay? If the police demand your identity when you have n they have not seen you committing an offense, just because they feel like it, or because they're suspicious, or because they want to have a record of who was in a certain place, you do have a right not to identify yourself. However, it's important for everyone to make a practical choice about whether they want to identify themselves anyway. Um, if you feel threatened, if you feel like it might make the situation easier, um, you might choose to identify yourself. And really that's a decision that's up to you based on your safety and other considerations. Um, you may want, you, one of the considerations would be privacy and whether or not your name might be included in, in certain records that later become searchable by law enforcement. Um, it is illegal, however, to give a false name, address or fake ID to the police. Okay, so um, uh, don't do that uh, because that could actually amount to a, a obstruction of justice and something that you could potentially be charged for. Um, if you, uh, when you do have to give your name and address to the police is if you're being arrested, if you're driving a car, and mind you, passengers don't have to provide this information, but drivers do. If you're being given a ticket for breaking a city bylaw or any other law, if you're being given an appearance notice to, to show up at court, um, or if you're being accused of trespassing under BC's Trespass Act. So in all of those situations, you do have to give your name and address. And if you refuse to do so, it could result in, in them deciding to um, charge you uh, with, uh, with obstruction. Under BC law, in the next slide, um, um, there's some real background noise that I'm getting. I don't know if someone's not muted there, but um, uh, just putting that out there. So under, uh, under the Police Act in BC, uniformed police do have to identify themselves by law uh, and have to wear a badge with their ID number or their name. The only exception is, is that senior officers don't have to wear those things. If the officer's identity is not clear, you can ask an officer to identify themselves. And of course, you can photograph officers. Um, if an officer is behaving improperly, um, uh, you may want to note their description, their height, their weight, their hair color, other distinguishing features um, uh, in case you later need to identify them. Uh, undercover officers do not have to identify themselves. And if you suspect that there is an undercover officer in your midst, um, we recommend that you do not try to expose that officer by shouting or by pointing because you could actually be charged with obstruction of justice for outing an undercover officer. If you believe that there's an undercover officer in your midst, um, uh, it's a better strategy generally to, um, you know, you can quietly let people know that you suspect someone may be an undercover officer so that people will be careful. Um, but um, you want to be really cautious about uh, trying to, to call them out. Now, uh, if they have their badge on, they don't actually need to tell you their, um, their name. And, and sometimes at Burnaby Mountain, I was getting questions from folks about, 
Um, well, the officer would refuse to tell me their name or something like that, but their badge number was clear on their uniform. And so they don't actually have to, if, if the identity is clear to you, they don't actually have to tell you anything further about it. I'm going to move to the next slide now. So what happens if you are getting arrested? Um, in general, in most protests in BC, it's fairly rare uh, for people to get arrested, but of course it does happen. And at Burnaby Mountain, we saw a very large mass arrest uh, for people who were uh, being accused of, of breaching uh, the injunction. Um, and you can only generally be arrested in a few circumstances. If there's a warrant out for your arrest, you can be arrested without warrant if the police believe on reasonable grounds that you've committed or are about to commit um, an indictable offense, which means a, a serious offense, um, or if the police see you committing any kind of criminal offense, whether serious or not. They can also arrest you um, if you are um, breaching uh, a court order uh, using their common law power, uh, not under the criminal code. Um, police have to tell you why you're being arrested unless it is obvious. Um, uh, you have the right to ask why you're being arrested. Um, so you can ask if you're under arrest, you can ask on what charge they, for what reason uh, you're being arrested. Um, and again, the police have to answer unless the answer is obvious. And it's important if this happens to you to try and remember what it is that they say. It can be very stressful, of course, if you're if you are being arrested um, or detained, um, it's usually a fairly high stress moment for many people and it can be hard to actually remember and kind of think straight afterwards. So if you're a witness to this happening and the police officers are giving information um, to your friend or a colleague or someone else uh, that you're organizing with, um, you can try and remember what it is that they say or to write it down because uh, that may be helpful later. Uh, everyone has a basic constitutional right um, to be uh, informed promptly of the reason uh, for their arrest. The next slide. Um, how will you know if you're under arrest? Well, you'll know you're under arrest if the police tell you um, or if they make it clear that you aren't free to go by physically holding you. Um, it's important uh, we recommend to stay calm. You do have to identify yourself. Um, police are allowed to conduct a full search of you and your personal property for evidence or weapons. Um, and it's important to cooperate fully with the arrest with the police if you are arrested, because any resistance could result in further potential charges. Um, you can go limp if you like. Um, the courts have said that that isn't resisting. You don't have to help them in arresting you, um, but you need to remember to do what's safe. If you go limp, uh, it's going to be the police's responsibility to carry you or to move your body. Um, and, um, you know, that may not be safe. Um, even if police are making their best effort to keep you safe, um, accidents can happen and, and you could be placed in, in some danger. And so you have to think very carefully about that. If you are taken to jail, you have the right to appear before a judge or justice of the peace as soon as is reasonably possible within um, 24 hours. Now, if you are arrested, you should immediately ask to speak to a lawyer. This is on my next slide. By the way, there's no such thing as only one phone call. Um, you have the right to take appropriate steps to get in touch with a lawyer. And beyond giving your ID information um, and your address, you do have the right to say uh, nothing. Complete first and last names, complete address and date of birth are the only things that you actually have to provide. Um, anything else, like they say on TV, could possibly be used uh, against you. So I'm going to skip to some of the common reasons for arrest. Um, um, civil contempt of court or criminal contempt of court, that was the reason that people on Burnaby Mountain were arrested. Um, it's not a traditional tr criminal charge. Um, and the requirement is that a court order has to have been breached. Uh, the order had to have stated clearly and unequivocally what should and what shouldn't be done. Uh, the party who disobeys the order has to do it deliberately and willfully, and the evidence must show that uh, they disobeyed the order beyond a reasonable doubt. It's possible to be, uh, have fines levied against you or made against you. It's even possible to be imprisoned um, for a civil and criminal contempt of court, although it's rare. Um, but because imprisonment is one of the possible options, 
Um, in this kind of a proceeding, you get all the kinds of procedural safeguards that you would normally get in a criminal trial. Um, criminal contempt, uh, as I said, is pretty rare and it adds a fourth element in addition to the first three, that there was an order that was clear, that you disobeyed it willfully, uh, and that um, the contempt is shown beyond a reasonable doubt. To have a, a charge of criminal contempt against you, um, your conduct has to be so much in defiance of the rule of law and designed to interfere with the court's order that it would bring the administration of justice into scorn or disrepute. And while this is rare, it does happen. Uh, Betty Krawcheck uh, uh, was uh, found guilty of criminal contempt of court because of her repeated disobeying of an injunction in relation to a forestry action back in like 2003 or so. She just kept going back despite being ordered not to do so. And uh, the court said at the time that um, her conduct was open, public, continuous and flagrant disobedience. It was staged and orchestrated with communication to the media um, for the purpose of dissemination to the public and without regard for the effect that her conduct might have on the respect accorded to orders of the court. And so when you had, in her case, repeated um, disobeying of the law or of the court's order accompanied by, uh, accompanied by um, a lot of publicity around it, the court in that case found um, uh, that she had committed criminal contempt and she was sentenced to imprisonment. There are other things like breach of the peace, um, if you're causing a disturbance that involves some potential for violence, uh, you can be um, uh, apprehended for breach of the peace. Uh, public intoxication, pretty obvious if you are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, if you commit mischief, I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. Uh, mischief is very wide ranging and is often used. It can include destroying, damaging, or rendering inoperative any property or preventing or interfering with its lawful use. Um, so for example, folks who um, uh, bash things into trees to try and prevent them from using uh, saws, these types of things um, could be uh, subject to mischief charges. Um, assault, um, using force against another person directly. Uh, which can include the threat of a, an assault and even just applying your hand to someone's arm without trying to hurt them um, can be uh, an assault. Uh, sometimes people can be charged with assault when they're resisting arrest. So if they lash out or if they, they kick or if they flail their arms out and it comes into contact with an officer, you could actually be um, charged with assaulting an officer. That's very serious indeed. Uh, Obstructing uh, a police officer is another one. Um, anyone who willfully obstructs the police in the execution of their duty. This can include things like getting too much in the way of the police. Um, uh, sometimes photographers or videographers uh, can risk this if they are um, getting too close to a situation in such a way that it, it interferes with the ability of police to do their duty. Um, um, there are lots of different ways that people could be found, or at least they could be accused of obstructing a police officer in these types of situations. And so it's, uh, it's very important to be, to be aware of that. I'm going to uh, skip ahead because I'm near the end of my time here uh, to the next slide, which is about civil liability. Um, so typically in a situation of uh, where you're getting sued, um, the company will ask the court for um, an injunction to get people to stop whatever it is they're doing. That's what happened on Burnaby Mountain. Um, there are different things that they can accuse you of. What people on Burnaby Mountain were accused of was interference with contractual relations. So stopping the test drillers from from uh, fulfilling their contract with Trans Mountain to drill. Um, and there were uh, damages claimed of $5.6 million for the time that would be lost and the money that would be lost. Um, trespass is another one. Uh, nuisance. Um, uh, those uh, protesters were also um, uh, accused in that lawsuit of the civil tort or the civil wrong of intimidation. People will remember KM face, Kinder Morgan face, people were making faces and, and otherwise appearing menacing, uh, or so it was alleged. Um, that was thrown into the lawsuit too. And um, these are pretty serious matters. Um, in addition, of course, 
being charged, potentially charged with civil contempt if you breach um, the injunction that accompanies these lawsuits, which a lot of people were charged with civil contempt of court. And remember, those court charges were all thrown out. Or if you don't remember, I'll tell you now, they were all thrown out because the company had screwed up where the line was in terms of the injunction zone. Uh, Sven will remember about that, I'm sure, and can talk about that after uh, I'm off the call. Um, but these torts can be fairly serious um, and they can tie people up with, um, with lawsuits that cost them a lot of money to defend. And so um, some of one of the persons from the, the Kinder Morgan lawsuit had to um, take out a mortgage on their home in order to, um, in order to pay for the, uh, pay for the costs. Uh, people were spending tens of thousands of dollars. In some cases, people can wind up being on the hook for, you know, into the hundred thousands of dollars just for the um, for the legal fees. Never mind if there's ever a judgment against them. And right now in BC, and I don't have time to talk about it, we don't have anti-slap suit legislation or uh, legislation that would allow for um, lawsuits to be easily thrown out when they're being brought for improper reasons, just to shut people up or to stop them using their freedom of expression. And so um, this issue of civil liability is a very serious one. Um, and uh, you know the the Kinder Morgan protesters who were being sued tried to have that suit thrown out, uh, and they were unable to get it uh, thrown out. It was eventually dropped, but the court said, "Look, um, even if this is infringing on your uh, your freedom of expression rights, um, the company did actually lose some money here, uh, arguably because of the stuff that you were doing. We haven't determined that yet, but at least there's an argument to be made. So no, I'm not throwing the the case out and we're going to have to litigate it. Um, and so it's really something uh, to think of the exposure to liability when you're contemplating um, the kinds of protest in which you engage and whether or not um, you might be exposing yourself to something that you don't expect. Um, I'll close my remarks on that. I don't have very much time for question, but, uh, but uh, here I am anyways. If you have any, you can ask me. Josh, we've got a question um, from Kathleen. I'm going to read it for you. What are the ramifications of protest-related charges in relation to international travel? Does it make a difference if the charge is civil versus criminal? Um, well, that's a really tough question to answer. So as an overall matter, any of these kinds of charges, whether or not they're ultimately dropped, um, can create um, barriers for you when you're trying to cross borders. Uh, all of the information in our police databases is able to be shared with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol officers, both inland here at Vancouver Airport um, and also on the U.S. side of the land border. Um, and so um, it's really up to the United States what they choose to do with that. They can decide as individual officers, oh, I don't really care about this or, oh, this wasn't that serious. Or they can decide that it's very serious. Um, and and decide not to let you into the United States. So any of these things, any of these things where you come into contact with the police have a potential to wind up in the hands of U.S. Customs and Border C Control. And we have no control anymore over what happens um, with that information when it's there. So there's not a lot of uh, comfort that I can give to folks about, oh, well, it was only a civil thing or whatever. Um, if your name is coming up as getting arrested, um, that can be trouble. Okay, great. And Josh, do you think you have time for one or two more? Sure. Okay. Um, and then I think we're going to try to get other ones to you after. Um, sure. Uh, there are some great questions coming in. Does the state of emergency in BC affect uh, arrests? You mean in relation, I guess we're talking in relation to the fires. Um, I'm not sure I can dispose of that quickly. I just don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay, great. And that was from um, Pranchu. Pranchu, thank you for your question. Um, can people defend them? This is from Terry. Can people defend themselves in lawsuits brought in the types of situations you describe? 
uh, if the question is, can you defend yourself without a lawyer? The answer is yes, but it's extremely difficult. Um, and all of these things uh, that, that are being accused against you tend to have very technical elements to them. Um, uh, and it can be really, really hard to successfully defend against them without counsel. So it can be done, but it's, it's difficult. Okay, great. I'm going to give you just one more question. And I have, I see that a few people are raising their hands because Josh is going to have to go in just a minute. Please do type your questions into either the chat or the questions area, and we'll try to get some more questions um, answered later. So don't just raise your hand, go ahead and type your question in. So the system will record them for us. Um, so last question for Josh. Um, Jeremy is asking the Burnaby RCMP said consent requires an affirmative. Can we ask the RCMP whether free prior and informed consent has been provided? Well, you can ask them about that for sure. Um, but it's not the RCMP's. So the the federal government and the provincial government have obligations um, under, I would argue, under the Union, uh, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to respect free prior and informed consent. And they have obligations under Canadian law to respect the constitutional rights of First Nations. But the Crown would say, the government would say, it's not individual RCMP members' jobs to adjudicate that on the spot. They have to follow the orders that they're being given. So if they're being ordered by a court um, to, to remove people uh, or told by a court that it's illegal for people to be in a certain place, they have discretion as to whether or not they're going to move in on a certain day or what they're going to do. They don't necessarily have to go in and make arrests, but it's not really up to them as individual officers to make decisions for themselves about, um, about what they're going to do in relation to whether or not indigenous rights have been respected. Now, in my saying this, I'm not condoning or saying that I think it's a good thing for government agents to act in violation of the, the Crown's constitutional obligations, not at all. Um, just that um, you, you can ask them that question, I wouldn't expect them to have a particular answer on it, and I wouldn't necessarily expect it to uh, affect the way that they're going to deal with you. All right, I literally have to go now uh, to pick up my kid at a, a childcare facility a day camp where she needs to be picked up from. I just can't stay any longer. So, um, uh, I'm happy to, to answer some other questions later and thank you very much. I'm gonna close my computer now. Great, thank you so much, Josh. And Bye, everyone. everyone. Everyone stay with us here. And again, um, uh, and we're going to bring Chief uh, Chamberlain and, and also Sven Biggs in. And if um, you did have a question for Josh, please do remember to um, type that into the chat or the questions area. Note that it's for Josh, and we'll work on getting some of those questions answered after. Okay. And... Um, Let's see, I'm just gonna see if we can get Sven's video going. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, great. <clears throat> and we, I'm sorry, will you remind me Sven, I can't, uh, I have forgotten the order of our next part. Bob, uh, this is the spot uh, to give a pitch for the Coast Protectors project if you wanted to do that now. <clears throat> Am I live now? Okay. I'm um, quite excited to see that there's an excess of 200 people that are on this webinar. Uh, the information that we just were provided was very useful in order for us to look after our rights. And of course, when I, when I think of the Coast Defenders and I think of the numbers that we have amassed, uh, it makes for a very stark political reality for the federal and provincial governments. And I believe that cities such as Burnaby and Vancouver and the provincial government recognize that, but where we fall down or where, where the message needs to be furthered is with the federal government. And of course, um, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs has a resolution very clearly opposing Kinder Morgan and the expansion standing in solidarity with the nations that are firmly opposed. 
But as with any effort within any campaign, uh, there is always, always, always a need for resources. And I know myself that I'll be contributing $20 to help with this. And I'm hoping that, you know, between all of us, if we can find that, uh, that place within us to maybe not go to Starbucks and Tim Hortons for a week and save that little bit of money and put it towards this very incredibly important initiative to stop something that has the potential to impact generations of British Columbians, Canadians, First Nations, and very long-term serious, serious threats to our environment. And for the 200 people that are on here, I wanna thank you, especially for your concern for the environment. Uh, I see it around the world now that people are turning to Aboriginal people and recognizing that our holistic views of lands, territory, and resources are indeed the path forward. Uh, it's in stark contrast to Western civilization's approach to uh, trees are to be cut down and oil is to be sold and so on and so on. But what we are facing now is actually the health and well-being of the very planet that we live on. And I know that everybody that's involved on this webinar today realized there is no plan B for uh, a, an earth to live on. And so I really wanna thank everyone for taking time to be here today and encourage you to speak to your family, your friends, your circle of influence, and let's keep some resourcing coming in so this important work can continue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chief Chamberlain. Uh, my name is Sven Biggs, and, and I wanna begin my little presentation here uh, by acknowledging that I am on the uh, the territory of the uh, Busqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples here in Vancouver. Uh, I'm going to update folks a little bit on uh, what's going on with Kinder Morgan's construction plan, um, what's happened with the provincial government recently, and uh, some upcoming court cases about uh, Kinder Morgan. And uh, then we'll open it up, and uh, Chief Chamberlain and I will uh, try to answer some of your questions about what's going on with Kinder Morgan. And um, we will also follow up this webcast with some resources. Uh, there'll be a, a video of everything, so you can watch Josh's uh, slideshow again and uh, go through that presentation. And those uh, two resources that he mentioned in his presentation, the arrest guide and uh, the, the other information about, about your legal rights in those situations. Um, so uh, we've heard a lot in the media uh, going all the way back to May when Kinder Morgan announced they had the financing in place for their, their pipeline, that they were planning to start construction on September 1st of this year. Um, and according to a uh, construction schedule they filed with the National Energy Board, what that's going to look like is um, in September they'll begin work on the tanker terminal in Burrard Inlet right across from the Swalwich community. Um, they're going to start working on expanding the tank farm that they have, uh, their current tank farm on Burnaby Mountain. Um, they also have plans to begin their tunneling operation under the mountain itself. And they're going to start constructing equipment and supply depots all along the route uh, stretching from, from Vancouver all the way to Edmonton. Um, They've continued to kind of raise the, the tension around this. Just last week, they announced that they had identified a contractor for the lower mainland uh, section of the pipeline. Uh, that's a consortium of two major uh, construction companies, Hewitt and Leadcore. Um, for folks who are on the call that are part of the labor movement, you'll be interested to know that both of those companies hire workers uh, through CLAC, or the Christian Labor Alliance of Canada, um, which uh, isn't part of uh, the mainstream labor movement, and in fact, it, it works with employers to undermine the rights of their workers. Um, and we've been told that, uh, that it's most likely that CLAC will represent workers on the Kingdom Morgan pipeline, and there's even a potential that uh, the companies will bring in temporary foreign workers to do the construction work. Um, amongst the kind of saber rattling that we've seen from Kinder Morgan around construction start, uh, they've even in response to the, the BC government's recent announcement of their first steps to uh, address the threats of the, of the pipeline, we, we saw them even in their statement in response to that, say that they were going ahead with construction on September 1st. 
So they've been very clear in the media that that's their plan. However, um, we think the announcement from the BC government really changes the playing field around construction and the timeline. So it was just two weeks now that uh, BC's new Attorney General, David Eby, and Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategies, George Heyman, announced the first steps that their government are going to take to protect BC's coasts and interests around the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Um, we think the most important part of that announcement was uh, saying that Kinder Morgan had not met key conditions that are part of the uh, permit that Christie Clark issued uh, to the company when it comes to consulting with First Nations. Um, without meeting these, these conditions, construction cannot begin on the pipeline. Um, this is as a result, I guess, of, of a long-standing process or uh, practice in industry of uh, just doing the bare minimum on consultations, what's often called tick box consultations with First Nations and Indigenous people, and governments of all political stripes turning a blind eye to that practice and allowing companies to get away with not meeting their, their, the requirements that they have under the Constitution and the permits that are issued by government. Um, so we think it's a, it's a strong signal that uh, this, our new government is going to enforce the law around this kind of consultation, and uh, we're really pleased to see that, that change beginning to happen in our provincial government. Um, it's really important to know that, that doing a proper consultation is going to take months. It is not a short-term or brief uh, making phone calls to band officers, what we've seen in the past. So um, this is really a, a, a serious break on construction. Um, we have also, as part of that announcement, the BC government hired uh, former Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of BC Chief Justice Thomas Berger to act as their new lawyer on uh, legal issues relating to Kinder Morgan. Um, Thomas Berger is probably best known for his work leading the McKenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry. He's also considered to be one of the pioneers of enshrining the rights of Indigenous people in Canadian law. So, and from our opinion, he's uh, probably one of the best possible people to, to take on this job. And we'll be watching closely to see what kind of uh, legal strategies he comes up with with the province and how they're implemented. Um, and then just yesterday, um, as one of the first act, his acts, uh, Thomas Berger, filed paperwork with the Federal Court of Appeals to intervene in the legal challenges that have been brought by First Nations and environmental groups and cities against the project. Um, we think the, this kind of package from the province is a really good first step. And um, we need to keep up the pressure on them to, to make more steps in this direction. But we're, we're pleased with the direction that they're headed in for, for now. Um, so that takes us uh, to the legal challenges that are going on. Right now there are 19 different legal challenges against the permits that have been issued for the Kinder Morgan Pipeline. And by far the strongest come from First Nations. Um, it was just announced last week. We have uh, court dates for the federal challenges. Um, they're gonna, going to start on October 2nd of this year and run through the 12th in the federal court here in Vancouver. Um, ultimately, it's these kind of cases brought by First Nations that stop Enbridge's Northern Gateway Pipeline. So we have a lot of hope for these cases. However, they're incredibly expensive and it's a huge burden for the First Nations that are bringing these court cases to have to, to uh, make. They have to literally choose between uh, putting money into these kind of trials and paying for lawyers and providing services to their communities in some cases. So it's a lot to ask them to do. Um, because of that, uh, the environmental community has come together and launched a fundraiser called Pull Together. You can find it online at pulltogether.ca. We've already raised half a million dollars through this. Um, we, the goal is, is $600,000, so we're close, but we need to raise more. And, um, but even then, we're just beginning to kind of scrape the barrel. A case like this, if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, could cost each nation involved over a million dollars. So 
more needs to be done to support those nations. Um, that, that is uh, kind of where we're at. We feel pretty strongly that uh, Kinder Morgan is going to try to continue to kind of bluff around construction. Uh, and we need to prepare both to, to stand up to them on the ground and uh, to support First Nations and other folks fighting them in the courts. Um, and I think we're ready for your questions. Take a look. Got a bunch uh, here that are, are probably better for a lawyer. Um, but I see uh, somebody here that asking about a construction camp near Belmont. Um, so this is one of those camps that, that I mentioned uh, that we were expecting to see in September if they go ahead. At this point, though, they would be in violation of provincial law if they did that. All right. And uh, Sven, this is Ann. We brought uh, Chief Chamberlain's video back up. And Chief Chamberlain, you're still muted, though. We should unmute you. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. So if there are other questions about what's going on. Okay, here I see a question from Lauren. Are there plans to picket the advertising and production companies listing us with KM Contractors Association Energy Company propaganda within greenwashing? Um, there aren't currently uh, anybody that I know of planning to, to target the folks making those ads, although that's an interesting point of view. What we've really found is that uh, by mobilizing on social media and organizing ourselves is the best way to push back. Uh, and Coast Protectors is a great part of that. So if you haven't already taken the Coast Protector pledge, uh, we encourage you to, to go to coastprotectors.ca and take the pledge and we'll keep you in the loop about what's going on and how to how to get more involved as we uh, move forward. Um, so I see a question here. Uh, in your view, is Burnaby going to be a hotspot, at least initially, for this protest? Um, I mean, based on the construction uh, schedule, um, it, it, it absolutely is going to be a hot spot. Um, one of the key things to get this project done on time, which Kinder Morgan needs to do to satisfy their investors, is to start the tunnel under Burnaby Mountain on September 1st. Um, currently, we don't believe that can legally happen. Uh, but Kinder Morgan seems willing to at least um, is at this point bluffing like they're going to go ahead with or without permits, um, which is a pretty dangerous thing to be doing. So um, I think folks in Burnaby uh, should be uh, thinking about uh, how to how to get organized. Um, but we also are uh, are uh, going to be looking for communities all along the pipeline to be standing up, and we know that there are folks organizing in the indigenous and non-indigenous communities to do that. Bob, did, uh, did you want to jump in on any of these? Well, there, there's quite a range of questions here, and I'm thinking, you know, like the, the one that I see from Robert about, uh, oh my gosh, where did it go? There's quite a list about the reasonable scenario. Uh, you know, I when I consider what's going on in, in Canada right now, where we have the federal government taking on the 10 principles for reconciliation with First Nations, and of course that is taking a backward look at different legislation and processes and laws, which are not consistent with that original rights and title or the current case law that's supposed to guide them. And so I'm curious to see just how quickly uh, the results of this federal initiative are going to be. And I'm also quite focused on how well this, uh, the coalition of the provincial NDP and the, and the provincial Green Party do in embracing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Of course, when you consider the division of power from the constitution between Canada and the province, uh, you have to then 
look, examine, and understand how is it that First Nations free prior consent is going to be folded into that decision making in the province and at the federal level. To meet with uh, Mr. Eifert when he did his work for the previous government. And I supposed to him, I said, well, if we're going to have a pipeline, I said, we have to be cognizant of the reconciliation direction from the, from the Supreme Court of Canada. And of course, that's not, in my mind, so simply focused on the government's relationship with First Nations, but First Nations' relationship with themselves, as well as with British Columbians. And I had suggested to him at that time at a couple of his meetings that from the source of the pipeline to the end of the pipeline, that they coordinate uh, workings of all the First Nations whose territories are affected or potentially affected vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, oil spills, which of course we know will happen. It, it's not a question of if the oil spill will happen, it's a question of where. And what I proposed was having a harmonizing of some measure of land use planning and economic development visions for each nation's territory to so understand each other's priorities and, and pursuits. But as I see it now, um, the, the free prior and informed consent seems to be going with the majority of First Nations or the ones that are, are most vocal or finding favor uh, with the government. And of course, I'm mindful of the work that's been going on on the uh, management and oversight committee of First Nations. Um, but I was quite surprised to see the minister announce that uh, that was one of the big reasons that Kinder Morgan got approved. Uh, of course, so that represents a group of First Nations coming together and expressing opinion, but it doesn't take into account the rights of those people that stand opposed. And certainly the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People does not say free prior and informed consent only if you're in a majority. Um, it talks about free prior and informed consent. So the Slaywood test, I think, not I think, I know that their rights need to be respected. Their wishes need to be embraced. They have an answer for free prior and informed consent. Uh, but what we're witnessing uh, right now with this uh, being approved by the federal government is what I've always said about consultation processes. Uh, I believe that Canadians want things to be fair. They want it to be just and to have adequate processes. I have yet to encounter myself or many leaders at all that can say that the consultation process with government has ever led to a meaningful stopping of an initiative supported by either Crown and industry. And so that's what I always say to people that say FPIC or Free Prior Informed Consent does not represent a counter argument to that is consultation has always led to the answer yes. That's very, very just at all. Um, but I, I do believe that we need now is an effort to bring First Nations together along this whole course with engagement with Canadians and really arrive at free prior enforcement that represents everybody's Indigenous rights. Thank you. Thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, we have another question here for you. Can you tell us uh, what you think about the potential for the federal government to expropriate First Nation uh, land for the Kinder Morgan pipeline? Well, uh, the concern that I've always had when I hear the government speak about major resource development, of course, is when they talk about it being in the national interest. And when I think, when I believe, when I hear those words uh, spoken by any level of government, well, of course, it's national, it's federal, um, that in their minds gives them the authority to override anything and everything. And I know that today when you drive down the highway or when you see um, perhaps unfavorable components of major projects, you find them on reserve. And so the government has zigzagged in the past to make sure that they land on reserve land. Um, but I think with the changing landscape today uh, around uh, the UN Declaration on Rights Indigenous People, uh, I think that not I think, I, I know that First Nations would stand up and be vehemently opposed if there's going to be an expropriation of reserve lands, um, if there's going to be uh, laying down of things which are completely unwelcome in our territories. Uh, and as I stated in the previous webinar, that I don't think there's a First Nation in Canada, top priority for economic development is, I want a pipeline through my territory to put everything at risk that we rely on and where I draw my identity from. Uh, there are ones that accept it as inevitable, but there is still the same resolve among many, many First Nations and British Columbians and, 
and Canadians that just simply don't want to see this project go ahead, that the risks far outweigh the benefits. And I don't believe the technology has advanced to the point now where we can have any measure of comfort in terms of this being um, a, su a successful building of this project. Thanks. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here from folks about banks and boycotts. Um, folks might not know that uh, Kinder Morgan is, is, as a company, not doing that well financially, um, and they needed to go out and borrow almost all of the $7.4 billion to, to build this pipeline. And the vast majority of that has come from Canada's big five banks. Uh, in, in particular, the Toronto Dominion that's paid a, a big role in uh, financing uh, this project. And we saw earlier this year some work uh, from Stan, but also from uh, the Treaty Alliance Against Tar Sands Expansion, which the Union of BC Indian Chiefs is a, is a key player in, and uh, Lead Now and some other groups working to put pressure on uh, Toronto Dominion to, to stop funding these kind of projects. Um, I think we're going to see more of that in the next little while, and people should look out for, from us and from other folks to, to get updates on how we can put pressure on the banks that are, are funding these projects and making them possible to, uh, to go ahead. Um, all right, I see we've got a question here uh, from about B Bill C-51 uh, and how that affects potential protesters. Chief Chamberlain, I, I know you, your organization did a little work on C-51. Do you have any thoughts on how it might impact this particular uh, project? Well, I think with Bill C-51, I mean, it lands squarely in that um, that area that the federal government is going to be reviewing in relationship to respecting of Aboriginal rights uh, as defined in the Constitution. Uh, again, like myself, like many leaders and many Canadians are, are now awaiting the outcome of the work of the federal government and modifying or, or doing away with various pieces of legislation that the Stephen Harper government thought was very beneficial. Um, I'm believing that the Liberal government is going to be, well, I'm remaining hopeful that there's going to be a thorough and comprehensive analysis with a thorough and comprehensive response. Um, I do know that it wasn't uh, first out the gate, it hasn't been as positive as we had hoped, uh, but I think that the, the continued pressure in the voice of Canadians uh, needs to be heard. Um, I've stated many times, if there's one thing that's incredibly sacred to every politician, it's your vote. And so if we can organize and make sure that we have a large scale, um, as large as we can make it, I mean, we all have different circles of influence and to ensure that we have the communication and the public statements and Twitter and Facebook and so on, uh, just to make sure that, that the message is out there. Um, Sven, I see a question here from Don Morrison about the collective land use planning I'd like to answer to. Um, I know that when we start to consider uh, land use planning, uh, I know myself as a First Nation leader, uh, when we've discussed this and envisioned this, it would have to include all of our hereditary chiefs, it would need to include our community, it needs to include uh, people beyond the reserve boundaries. And I believe now that when we start to uh, react or respond to the challenge from Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould about who are the appropriate title holders for our territories, that we have to begin those discussions for ourselves within our communities. Of course, that begins with talking with our families and making sure that the council is responsive to those situations. Um, so I would like to see, and what I propose to Mr. Eifert is that we look at um, all the land use plans, uh, because now we can view those not simply as a tool to engage with the provincial government, but actually can be viewed as an expression of a First Nations interests or what they wish to see within their title lands. And of course that is then supported by the Chilcotin where our lands are territorial in nature. Um, it then also responds to the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. And as been mentioned by the federal government, this commitment now from the feds and the provincial government on UN DRIP squarely puts the ball back in our court to prepare ourselves to make sure that we have the proper mechanisms in place and the appropriate governance structures uh, to ensure that our membership or what gets speak, spoken by leaders is in fact representative of all the membership, not just ones that are on and off reserve. So Don, I hope that, uh, I hope that answers your question. 
Hey, uh, Liz, I see a question here from Trevor seeking some clarification around uh, the QIT lead core contracting and uh, them using CLAC as the, the employee representative. Um, we've actually been in touch with the BC Building Trade and it, it's based on their information that we believe these jobs will likely be through CLAC. Uh, we are at one o'clock, just a little over. Um, so I'm gonna ask Chief Chamberlain for some closing thoughts and then we'll wrap up. Um, we're hoping to hold more webinars like this as uh, this issue heats up over the fall. So please uh, look out for invites in your inbox. And if we didn't answer some of your questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us by email and we'll do our best to get back to you and answer all of them. Okay. Well, Ben, thank you for, uh, for your assistance on this important webinar today. And um, I'm, again, I can't say it enough. I want to thank everybody that's taken the time to, to be a part of this and become more informed of how it is that you can actively participate and yet always be mindful of your own individual rights, just as Aboriginal people are, are very mindful of our Aboriginal rights. Uh, if there's one thing I'd like to leave everybody with is the fact that on September 9th at 1 p.m. at the Vancouver Art Gallery, um, organized by Climate Convergence, there is going to be the answer is still no. And it's going to be a rally, of course, that's going to be focused on the topic at hand. Uh, I'm going to review my calendar and I'm really hoping that I have that time open so I can be there. Uh, but I very much encourage everybody to make time. And whether it's on September 9th at 1 p.m. at the Vancouver Art Gallery or wherever these things are going to be held, is that we show up in numbers, we ensure our, as broad a group as and representative of British Columbians can be there so we can have that message. And I encourage everyone that's on this webinar to find ways to support First Nations in terms of advancing our vision for our lands and title and to become knowledgeable of the 10 principles of reconciliation which the federal government is pursuing because that is going to be where justice is found for First Nations, and it's going to be able to put us in a place where we are going to be able to speak to our territories. And I think that by and large, we're finding a lot of unity with Canadians and protection of the environment. So thank you very much for this opportunity.